we've come to the very end of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 14 to 20, to be precise, a message titled, The Heart of Giving. Now, I want to kind of preface the message, The Heart of Giving, with an explanation of the prosperity gospel. Now, you may have heard it. The prosperity gospel is propagated largely in America. It is how the gospel goes out that you deserve health, wealth, and prosperity. But I want to teach on the proper application of the prosperity gospel. Because here's the proper prosperity gospel that you need to receive tonight. That not you're prospering because of the gospel, but that the gospel prospers inside of you. That's the prosperity gospel that God is in. That your soul would prosper. That your emotional man or woman would prosper. Not that you would prosper financially, materially, or even in your health. Those are great and grand, but sometimes, just sometimes, God will allow those things to be lost so that you lean even more into your spiritual health. So we're going to learn tonight the proper application of giving and what is the heart behind our giving. Now, like Pastor Matt Stokes says, We don't kind of just go off on our own and try to get the congregation to buy into a message that I mustered up on my own. We go through the scriptures verse by verse, which means if we come across a certain verse that deals with a certain issue, we're going to teach it. So I'm going to let the scriptures talk tonight. I'm going to parallel a lot of scriptures with our Philippians test. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there in advance to Philippians chapter 4, verses 14 to 20, and here we go. Last week we left off with the greatest secret of life Paul Penn, that the greatest secret that he's learned to become content in any circumstance, whether he's had or he has not, whether he finds himself in a position of exaltation or a position of humiliation, Paul says, I've learned what it means to be content. He stops and says to the church, I thank you for your gift to me, but I want you to understand I am not dependent upon your gift. Because I've learned whatever state I'm in to be satisfied. Let me define contentment before we move forward. Biblical contentment is being satisfied because you know that your faith in Christ is sufficient. Your faith is not dependent upon circumstances or even feelings. Your faith in Jesus Christ infused in you will allow you to endure through anything. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can endure this conflict. I could suffer through this persecution. I can endure this because Christ in me gives me the strength to keep moving forward. Now your greatest resource then that you can ever possess is not riches. It's not religion. It is your relationship with Jesus Christ. The greatest resource that the believer should be pursuing day by day is our relationship in Jesus Christ. Now we say, I come to my understanding when I give my life to Christ. Well, what about the other things in my life that are considered maybe weaknesses? Does he want those too? Oh, absolutely. In fact, the greatest resource is your faith that even your weaknesses, when given to God, become strengths. Paul struggled with that. He said, I got this thorn in the flesh, and I pled with the Lord to remove it. And I love it because the answer that comes back after the prayer, which is, Lord, remove it. I'm struggling with this. It's an irritant. It's a nag. And God whispers, oh, Paul, I'm not going to answer your prayer for removal. In fact, the thorn is by my approval, and it's My grace should be sufficient. Think about that. The word sufficient, again, ties in with the word content. I need you to be content no matter what you are facing in life, recognizing that it's the grace of God that saves and it's the grace of God that sustains. See, the Apostle Paul understood that. He was dependent upon Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. He continues his letter to the church. In fact, we're to cover verses tonight. This is pretty much the very reason he wrote this letter in the first place. We come to the place in the epistle where he's telling them, thank you. That's why he wrote the letter. Remember, earlier on we were introduced to a man named Epaphroditus. He's going to show up again in today's text. 
Epaphroditus was sent by the church to give Paul a gift. The gift was a financial gift, money. They gave to the cause of Christ. They gave to their minister. They gave to the missionary, Paul, to advance the gospel. They believed in the work that he was doing, so they gave to him. And Paul stops, and he writes back, and he says in verse 14, as we'll read it, Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you, Philippians, know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Notice he's not asking for financial aid. He's thanking them for the aid that was financial and material. He's saying to them, I am grateful for you partnering with me in the advancement of the gospel. Hey, since I left you, since we have planted this church and I went on to other cities like Thessalonica, Ephesus, Galatia, no other church partnered with me like you did. This was huge because as he ministered and labored in areas, this church followed him with their compassion, with their concern, with their care. And he wants them to know, I appreciate you entering into my distress. Now, what made them enter into his distress? Now, if you go back 10 years, when he planted the church in this city called Philippi, he entered into their distress. See, they were absent of God. They were absent of the gospel. In fact, Philippi was a mini Rome to touch down in Philippi and reach those people would have been instrumental to reach the entire Roman Empire. In fact, if you can imagine the Apostle Paul's prayer, God, send me. I'm going to reach that people. Send me as a preacher. And God says, I got a different plan. I'm going to send you as a prisoner. And he ends up in Rome, in a jail cell, reaching the people he prayed about thanking them backwards, saying, your gift to me has allowed me to minister to other people. Now, I love this because he makes reference to giving and the receiving part. Interesting, he's talking spiritual and physical. He's saying nobody's partnered with me in the physical giving and receiving and the spiritual giving and receiving. It's called reciprocity. Anybody in a relationship in this room tonight knows it can't just be one-sided, it can't just be about taking. There's also got to be a balance of giving. Paul is affirming that what they gave him has ministered to him, and he's thanking them for entering into his distress. But previous, of course, we must make it very clear that when Paul entered into their distress, when he planted their church, what did he leave them with? He didn't leave them with money. He left them with the gospel. He left them with the riches of heaven. In other words, he gave them the only antidote that could heal or cure a sick soul, and that's the gospel. And if you've been ministered to by the gospel and your sick soul has been healed, what are you to give to the world around you if you've been cured by the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'll tell you, the only right response to being cured by the gospel is to give compassion out. Because God gave compassion to us, we then, in proportion to the mercy and compassion we know, that should be the proportion of mercy and compassion we show. Because if the gospel was the antidote to cure the sick soul, then I'm telling this assembly, compassion is the medicine that lifts the soul. Amen. When you give somebody compassion, you lift their soul. But there's no way to give compassion. Church, look at me. There is no way to give compassion without entering in. You see, compassion is spiritual medicine that is only administered by entering in. You must enter into other people's distress. Remember from last week, we talked about care, compassion. Let me define compassion. Compassion is your pain in my heart. Interestingly, the most compassionate people are those who went through some very broken experiences. 
And there's no way they could empathize or feel what you feel had they not been through it themselves. Do you see the value of why God allows us to go through stuff back here? Because he sees somebody up there that you don't see that's going to need your care, your comfort, and your compassion. And if God don't heal you back there, you can't minister to people up here. So we enter in to each other's lives, the distresses, the trials, the afflictions, and we enter in. And I can't take it from you, but what I can administer to you is compassion. Sometimes just letting somebody know, I can relate to that. I can't help you get out of that, but I can enter in and be with you while you're in that. And people begin to feel that you care. Compassion is like medicine. The opposite of compassion is condemnation. Condemnation is like poison. How often do we enter into other people's distress with condemnation? Condemnation. How'd they get into that? And we so easily judge down. I would never do something like that. And all the while, we're giving them the opposite of what they actually need. Compassion is like medicine. And here are people of God who are broken from their past, healed so they can administer compassion in their present. Now here I'm gonna make a case that conversely, it is discontented people that can't administer compassion. Let me make the connection. When Paul says he's content, he's dependent upon Christ. Did not matter where he was in position. Remember, he's in prison. It didn't matter what he had in possession. He had nothing, but he learned to be content. But instead of focusing on himself, which is discontent, what's he doing? He's focusing on other people, the church. He's not worried about how he's gonna get out. He's writing back to them, applauding their efforts. He's affirming their faith. That's why discontented people who are always trying to get out of their circumstances, always trying to get more in life, they don't have eyes to see other people in need. But, oh, content people who are satisfied with their position where God has them, with their possessions, what God has entrusted to them, they can see clearly the needs of those around them. So I'm going to be that type of person. I want to be as John the Apostle would write to the church in the early days out of 1 John chapter 3, verse 17. I want to be the type of believer that lays down my life for a friend. Listen to the language, ready? Verse 16, by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for others. Okay, instantly I think Jesus laid down his physical life. He died on the cross for the salvation of our souls. And I go, I want that. But that's not exactly what John is writing about. Verse 17 tells us what he's talking about. You ready? Because whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? How do you lay down your life for the brethren? Oh, it's how you handle your material goods. It's how you handle your financial goods. It's how you handle what God has entrusted to you in time, in talents, and in treasure. To lay down your life is to say, what I have is not my own, and I'm gonna use it to advance the gospel. I am going to enter into other people's lives with what God has given me in abundance so I can advance the gospel. Here's the rhetorical question. So here we have to consider, how are we compassionately entering in to the lives of others with our time, our talents, and our treasures. How are you entering in to the lives of others with the time that God has entrusted to you? What are we doing with our time? What are we doing with the talents God has given us? What are we doing with, of course, ready? Our money, the material possessions. Recently, I was called by a friend Newell's in ministry, not connected to this church body, asked me if I knew anybody in need, instantly thought of a family. The person didn't stop there. They wanted to bless this family, so they asked specific questions about the family, about the children, about the likes and dislikes. They wanted to make sure that if they were going to bless a family in need, that it would be pre precise, it would be unique. And they went above and beyond. They went out and purchased a lot of things that this family was in need of during the holiday season. And they chose to enter in with their time, out of their way they went. With their talents, 
the way they specifically and uniquely catered these gifts to this family and oh, with their treasures because it was a sacrifice to give the amount they gave. What made them do that? John says the love of God in them because if we have material goods, that's what that word means in John, if you have goods and you see somebody in need and you shut your heart up from them, how can we say the love of God is, is in us? Paul will write in verse 17, he gets back to the heart of giving. You ready for this? Hey, not that I seek the gift. Not that I'm talking about the financial gift that you gave me. That was a blessing. Oh, I needed that at the time. It, it came. But I'm not talking about the gift. I'm talking about the fruit that abounds to your account because of the gift. We've got to make a differentiation Paul is saying the gift which was financial was a blessing. But I am not talking about that. I'm talking about the state of your heart. I'm talking about your development spiritually, your faith, how I am so pleased of how you, by yourselves, found it necessary to give. Paul was so moved by that. See, he wasn't talking about them giving out of compulsion or guilt. Paul was applauding the fact that they gave out of grace. And there's a huge difference there. Let me explain to you. This is a very distinct difference behind a minister, and I'm one of them, and a ministry, that's what we're a part of here, how you could tell what they're focused on. Because most TV evangelists, if you listen carefully, if they spend more time focusing on the raising of money over the effectiveness of ministry, you got to step back and say, wait, what am I giving to? Recently, a minister who's very well known was asking his following to contribute to the ministry so he could purchase a large jet. And under the persuasion that if I get a larger jet, I could do more traveling. And if I do more traveling, I could share more of the gospel. Oh, really? If the focus is more on money than ministry. That's what we have to start stepping back and saying, I don't know if I can give to that. I'm not up here telling you to stop giving to certain causes. I'm asking you as believers to consider the state of your heart as you give and the state of the ministry that you're giving to. Pastor Matt says it all the time. He's like, I've been here for 15 years. You never hear me talking about money. When he brings it up, it's because of ministry. It's because of a specific and effective ministry that we're saying, hey, you believe in what's going on here on live stream? You believe souls are being saved even as they watch online? Well, if you believe that, we want you to give towards that. And we would write you a letter like Paul. Hey, we're not talking, we're talking about the gift. We're talking about how happy we are that you are developing spiritually because of the way you give. Huge difference. I'm going to make that very clear. As I said earlier, I'm not talking about the prosperity gospel. And if you give to this ministry, you will be blessed abundantly. No, no, no. God wants you to be prospering internally first and foremost. So here's what is being conveyed in verse 17. That the greater value isn't in the gift, but in the state of how your heart gives. That's ultimately what we should consider tonight. Not in the amount we give, whether it's time, whether it's talents, whether it's treasure, but what's the state of my heart by which I give? This is a haunting text. We're going to go there together. It's found in Mark, Mark chapter 12, verse 41 to 44. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury, and saw how the people put money into the treasury. Did you catch that? Jesus, sitting opposite the treasury, at the temple there was a public place to drop off your offering. Just as we do an offering time, there was a public presentation where you could drop off your offering in the public's eye. Jesus sits opposite of the treasury, watching people put money into the treasury. Then one, and many who were rich put much in. That's what it says. But many who were rich put much in. Verse 42. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which if you know anything about the equivalency 
of that amount of money, it's less than a penny. It's less than a copper. She puts in two mites, which make a quadrant. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For out of their abundance they gave. But she, out of her poverty, she put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. Oh, she laid down her life. Do you understand what just took place there? Wait a second, Jesus. You're trying to tell us that those people that went before her, they put in thousands and thousands of dollars. Jesus says, yeah, do you see all they put in? Add it up. Oh, that's nothing in comparison to what she put in. See, it wasn't about the amount. It wasn't about what they gave. It was about the state of their heart as they gave. Why was her penny worth eternity? Because of her heart's sincerity. See that? It's because of how she gave. That's what Paul is applauding the church for. He says, I'm not seeking the gift. Yeah, it was a lot. I appreciate it. I am so pleased with the state of your heart by which you gave. He was affirming their spiritual development. He was affirming their godliness. And in verse 18, he says, Indeed, I have all and abound. The word is, I have more than enough. I am overflowing. What you gave to me, it tipped the scales. I am overflowing with joy. I am full, he writes, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you. That's why they sent Epaphroditus. He was the messenger to check up on Paul. They had a, a respect for Paul, a love for Paul. They wanted to make sure he was okay. They couldn't find him. Finally, they locate him. He's locked up. So when Epaphroditus gets there, if you recall from chapter 2, Epaphroditus gets sick. And Paul, in the letter, writes back, I'm sending him back to you. I know you guys want him to benefit me, but I'm sending him back to you because he's sad that you heard he's sick, and I'm sending him back to you. What type of hearts did this church have? They were all concerned with each other, not themselves. No, I want to stay with you, Paul. No, Paul goes, you're, you're sick. If you stay here outside of your care that you need, then I don't want to have your health on my hands. I'm sending you back. And I'm sending you back because you're concerned that they're worried about you. It's a beautiful balance of love and care and respect and appreciation for each other. It's compassion. It's because they understood God's compassion on them. He finally writes, Oh, your gift was a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Are you seeing how he's receiving their gift? He's saying, your gift was great, but I'm more pleased with the state of your heart and what is accruing to your account because what you're giving to me is helping me administer the spiritual salvaging of the soul. And based on my work here, you are partnering with that process. So what's going to be stored up for you in heaven is interest, spiritual interest based on your giving for me. I love that. They weren't even close to the work that was done on the field. But based on their concern, whether it's by praying for someone, you're partnering with that person's progress. Whether it's by giving to someone, he ultimately says, what you gave was worshipful. It was a sweet-smelling aroma, a sacrifice to God. He is alluding to, church, look at me. He's alluding to Old Testament sacrifices, where they would bring a, an animal to the altar, they would sacrifice it, they would slaughter it, and then they would burn it. And the scent would rise up in smoke. And they said that was a burnt offering, and it was as if the Lord was lending his nose to smell a beautiful scent based on their sacrifice and their giving. That's exactly what Paul is pointing to here. He's saying what you gave was a sacrifice. It was worshipful. It was for God's glory. So here's the challenge for us. First things first, we got to consider that there's no other cause worth giving to in time, 
in talents, in treasure, in energy, except the gospel. No other cause that is eternal except the advancement of the gospel. No other cause that is eternal except the advancement of the gospel. Doesn't matter how good it looks, doesn't matter how outreaching it may be, nothing can advance the soul except the gospel. Nothing can save the soul except the gospel. Doesn't matter how much money we can raise, doesn't matter how many statistics we can discover through our research, what matters most is the advancement of the gospel. I want to drive that home tonight because this ministry would be worth nothing if we didn't advance the gospel, if we didn't allow you to allow the gospel to advance in you and for you to leave this building and advance the gospel out there. This would be pointless. This would actually be a very weird hobby that we have on Thursdays. You got to come out. It's my favorite hobby, Thursday nights, comfortable seats, we sing some songs, and then this crazy young minister comes out, and boy, he's a ball of energy. What else do you guys do? That's it. Oh, that's it. Oh, no, we go deep. We want the gospel to advance inside of us. Heard a story, little girl, mom called her, pleased with her. Here's $2. She took the $2, but wait. Before you go, one dollar you must put in the offering plate on Sunday at church. Okay, mom, and off she went out the door, down the street to the candy store. Right before she walked into the candy store, she tripped and fell, and one dollar fell down the sewer drain. She quickly, unfazed, got up, looked to the sky, and said, Sorry, Lord, there goes your dollar, and in she went. And if I'm honest, that's me. At the end of my month, sorry, Lord, there went your money. Sorry, Lord, I'm exhausted. I spent all my time doing this. We don't have more time to give God because we're too busy spending it in other places. And I'm saying, if it's not spent on that which is advancing the gospel, it cannot be eternal. I want to make that very clear. Doesn't matter how good it looks, if it's not advancing the gospel, it is not an investment in what is eternal. So here I come directly to your mailbox because it is infinitely better to invest in heaven than to have your only sense of heaven to be an investment. Did you catch that? It is infinitely better to invest in heaven. Lord, I want to invest in your economy than to have your only sense of heaven to be an earthly investment. You know how many people's sense of heaven and prosperity and comfort, their sense of heaven is an investment on earth? And that's why Jesus said, you, you, you shouldn't be storing up treasures on earth where moth and rust can destroy and a thief could break in and rob. Oh, but store up your treasures in heaven where that can't happen because whatever you put into God's hands can't be stolen. Oh, imagine a community of believers that said, what we have is not ours, and we're going to invest into the work of God. That we would take the I must statement from Jesus as a 12-year-old boy and say with all of our hearts and sincerity, I must be about my father's business. And what I'm investing in on my earth, my temporal life, is reaping eternal dividends. It's going to look differently in all of our lives. All of us have unique callings. That unique calling, I'll say separate, but inseparable from the body. What God has called you to do individually, occupationally, cannot be divided from what he's called you to do vocationally. Vocationally means calling in Latin. See, some of you in this room might be school teachers, lawyers, judges, police officers, social workers, secretaries. That's your occupation, but you are God's representation within that occupation. Oh, that's your calling. So yes, you might be behind a desk, but how you invest that smile upon that person that you encounter, oh, that's an investment into heaven. Because when they see you, you better believe they're going to see God. Whether you realize it or not, and I haven't said this in a long time, you may be the only Bible somebody reads. So we come in on a Thursday night. We say, Lord, do surgery in our hearts because I'm struggling with what you've entrusted to me. And that's why we must consider 
what we do with our money, listen, is an indication of where we're at spiritually. God don't need our money. God don't need our time. God doesn't need our material things. But what I do with them is an indication of whether or not I believe in that which is eternal. Let me explain that. When he asked me to give, what I'm giving away is a piece of my selfishness. Because you already know, it's hard when you have. This is all I have left. And it's hard to give because it's so little. And God goes, do you trust me? See, it's not about what you're about to give me. What I'm trying to free you from is the greed of keeping. So I give away my selfishness when I sacrifice my time to spend others and minister to them in their distress. I enter in with comfort and compassion. Could find a lot of other things during the week to do, can't we? But I want to invest in that which is eternal. And here's why. Jesus out of 38 parables, these are interesting numbers. Out of 38 parables, Jesus told 16 of them dealing with money and possessions and how you're stewarding what he gave us. 16 out of 38, that's interesting. In the Gospels, one out of 10 verses, one out of 10, 288 in total, deal directly with money and material things. Watch this. The Bible offers 500 specific and direct verses that deal with prayer. 500 specifically. 500 specific and direct verses that deal with faith. But over 2,000 verses in the Gospels alone deal with money and possessions. Why? Oh, because if I'm wrapped up in the things of this world, the material things of this world, how can I be about the eternal things of God's world? So Jesus is constantly reminding people that you are not your possessions. And ultimately, when we give of our time and our talents and our treasures to God, we cannot outgive a God who in verse 19, Paul will say, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Listen to the language here. Paul is saying, my God. He's saying it definitively. He's making a claim personally on his God. My God, I am confident that even though you gave to me, Paul's writing, my God will supply your need. Because you met my need, my God is going to supply your need. Let me get this out of the way, that I am talking about the need of your soul first and foremost. God is going to fulfill the need of your soul first and foremost. But Jesus said, stop worrying about what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, where you're going to live, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all those things you're concerned about. I will provide unto you. I'll give them to you. Now, this is kind of a weird paradox to consider, but it's backwards for the believer. You ready for this? I so easily believe God for the saving of my soul from hell. But then I don't trust him for the providing of my body on earth. I believe that you could save my soul from hell, eternal hell, but I have a hard time trusting him for the provision of the body on earth. And ultimately we worry about the material, about the financial, and that's why God, through his word, is saying, take your grips off it. There was a story about a minister dealing with a friend, of course, and the friend was committing to give to a certain cause, and he came to the minister for advisement, and he said, listen, I don't have a problem giving, but at the end of the month, I'm just struggling with bills. And the minister said, listen, if you ever come up short at the end of any month, I will cover it personally. The friend said, would you do that? He says, yeah, give, and if you come up short, I'll provide for you. The friend went off. In reflection, the minister would write how easily we trust people to cover our needs. And sadly, don't put that same emphasis and trust 
on a God for our needs. It's, it's hard because we can't see him. We can see each other. But that's where faith and walking by faith, not by sight, comes to play. I have written down, so I'll read it. When we give out cheerfully, God outgives us abundantly. Here's a, a text that will confirm that. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. But I say, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. And simple. You only sow a few seeds, you're only going to reap a few seeds. But he who sows bountifully with your time, with your talents, with your treasures, oh, that person will reap bountifully. Watch this. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, but God will love a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you. That you, always having, you ready? All sufficiency. My grace is sufficient. Paul says, I've learned sufficiency. It's my faith in Jesus Christ. And all things may have an abundance for every good work. I love these texts. Philippians tells us, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches. Corinthians tells us, God will grace us with sufficiency. Proverbs reads, chapter 11, there is one who scatters yet increases more, and there is one who withholds more than is right, but that leads to poverty. The generous soul, excuse me, the generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will be watered himself. Jesus said in Acts, as they quoted him, it is more blessed to give than to receive. What we're giving of our lives. Because ultimately, it is impossible to outgive a God who gives out of himself. You can't outgive God who gave us himself. What then shall we say to these things? Paul would write in Romans. If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him, Jesus, also give us freely all things? Did you catch that? How shall he not with Jesus, who he gave us, freely give us other things? What else we need? This is a burden lifter for you to come in tonight worrying about how God's going to provide. Oh, he's got you. He will supply all your need. Just keep looking to him. Don't go the way of the world that tells you you need to save it up. Give back to God and his work, and he will give back to you. Verse 20 is Paul's way of exploding in praise. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Which means so be it. Now, if you have your Bibles open, you could probably read the next three verses and be done the chapter and be done the book. But I looked at those three verses and I said, not so fast. Because there's a piece in those three verses that is going to take us backwards before we go forward. Because we must stop and consider that when Paul says those in Caesar's household greet you, you must ask yourself, who are those people in Caesar's household? The Caesar who wanted to kill the apostle? Who are these people? And why would they be counted as part of the church? We'll find that out next Thursday as we get back into the Word of God and completely complete the book of Philippians. But till then, would you consider what we laid out tonight? That the prosperity gospel isn't you prospering because of the gospel. It's that the gospel would prosper inside of you. That we would take our grip off the things of this world and pursue and seek the things of God's world. Will we trust him with how we're giving to his work here on earth, whether it's our time, whether it's our treasures, and of course, whether it's 
our talents. Because since we're not dead, we are not done. We've heard it. Let's do it. God bless.